Hi guys, my name is Sina. Hey everyone, my name is Carmen. Uh, our presentation deals with the influence of social status on education. And since the articles that were posted for the DDJ this week were over 25 years old, we decided to include a video that has some more relevant and current information on the topic that we're going to be talking about today. For Complex Hustle, I'm Brian Hanley. In the mid-1980s, the average gap in standardized test scores between the richest 10% of American students and the poorest 10% was about 90 points out of an 800-point scale. Wealthier students do tend to have access to the best teachers, not to mention better student-teacher ratios, SAT classes and private tutors, nutritious meals and after-school programs, and computers and Wi-Fi access at home. The 90-point achievement gap in the 1980s might not concern you at all. If you, like many people in this country, assume that the poor remain poor because they're somehow incapable or lazy. But what if I were to tell you that the real reason the poor remain poor is that they lack the basic resources and opportunities necessary to escape from poverty? And that over the last 30 years, the achievement gap in this country has actually grown larger to the point where upward mobility is becoming less and less of a reality. In 2014, for instance, the average gap in standardized test scores between the richest and poorest 10% grew to 125 points. 35 points higher than it was just three decades ago. Of all the 65 countries now involved in the program for international student assessment, the US ranks among the worst in terms of the mathematical achievement gap between rich and poor. According to economist Robert Reich, that's a direct result of the nation's increasing residential segregation by income. An increase in residential segregation by income means it's getting more common for rich and poor families to be living in different neighborhoods based on the houses and property taxes that they can afford. Well, as it turns out, public schools in this country are largely funded at the local level, which means the poorest communities, which also suffer from the weakest real estate markets, have less and less tax revenue to give to their public schools. Meanwhile, the richest communities have an abundance of wealth. Their fancy homes come with high property taxes, allowing wealthier communities to finance only the best public schools. And so we see that public schools aren't exactly public when they're funded by local tax revenue. Many of these so-called public schools are really just private schools, whose tuition, as Robert Reich explains, is hidden away in the purchase price of upscale homes there and in corresponding property taxes. So, Another um, so it is impossible to deny the fact that in the United States, the richer get richer and the poor get poorest which is why we often hear those terms like world gap or wealth inequality are used often those days. Definitely the social standards have an impact on our child education and the way our school are function. Child education depends on the community their school is located. Everyone knows that schools function on local taxes, so the more richer the community is, the better school system is offered. Building of this video, here is some quick activity that we create for you guys to participate in. Now looking at your words, I'm sure that you'll notice you'll either have the same or some phrases that are very similar to the phrases African Americans, poor, underprivileged, behavioral issues, low achieving, absenteeism, or low scores. And unfortunately, inner city schools are more often than not associated with some of those negative connotations. And yes, these schools usually have more struggles than a school in the suburbs or private school, but even with all the research that's been done and found, we still don't have solutions or increased amounts of improvement. And I think that until these terms stop being associated with inner city schools, that the students, the schools, and even the communities can't improve. Sub coverage won't get better, teacher attendance rates will not increase, which means student-teacher relationships, of course, won't grow, and then it'll lead to increased amounts of absent students and increased amounts of students who just don't really care about school, especially in the middle school and high school levels. In the book that I posted in the Dropbox um, called Efficient Learning for the Poor, it talks about how a majority of students 
are those that are academically weaker because they get bored in school or because they're students that get mistreated at home. And unfortunately, a lot of times it's because they're being sexually harassed at home. And the book goes on to talk about how the only reason some of the kids do come to school is for food or to avoid the drama at home, even though they don't really care about the educational aspect of school. School basically becomes a roof over their head for them. And one of the ways that most schools handle their diverse levels is by creating these three different classes, and then they become the, either part of the SPED class, the Gen Ed class, or the Accelerated class. And I know for me, I see these three different groups on a daily basis, and it's usually very clear that there is a difference in class status between the kids. What I sometimes struggle with is teaching that same exact content to all three classes and using the same medias. My two inclusive classes are unfortunately less motivated, so I do wish that I could be teaching them reading and writing strategies that they need via relevant text and content rather than some of the more bleak informational text that we use um, throughout the day. Um, these students usually get bored and irritated quickly, so I think that if the content that we were teaching them um, was more interesting to them, that they would be more likely to be motivated and more likely to work and participate in the class. So what I've done to really show you guys what I'm talking about is I held interviews that were very similar to Jean Anon's interviews, and I asked students from each of the, each of the three groups about four questions um, about the term knowledge. And as you're watching these clips, you can think about the different class sections they come from and what might have influenced not only their answers, but also their entire demeanor during the interview. Uh, now, just so you know, these are all my seventh grade students. So um, they stayed back during lunch and were willingly participating in this interview. So here they are. Our knowledge is information that you've um, picked up throughout your life and that you've been taught to by many teachers in schools. Okay, so you were able to come up with an answer to all of my questions, so clearly you have knowledge. How much knowledge do you think you have and what stops you from gaining more? I think I have the average amount for being my age and being what I've t been taught to, seeing what I've seen. I have met to di many different places, been taught different things. Um, what's stopping me from making new knowledge is um, what I've only been taught from at this very moment would like, keep me from making knowledge that's greater than what I have right now. Okay, first question. What is knowledge? Knowledge is like what when you think and get ideas and stuff. Okay, and where does knowledge come from? Your brain, your mind. And can you make knowledge? I don't think so. So you were able to answer all the questions, so you have some type of knowledge. Um, how much knowledge do you think you have and what stops you from gaining more? You only think a little bit? I do. Okay. And what stops you from gaining more? Do you think there's different ways that we can create knowledge without having to depend on other people? Do you think you can come up with knowledge on your own? Sort of, yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. First question. What is knowledge? Um, knowledge is a sort of sort of smart that you gain along the road as you're growing up. You learn it from, you get it from your parents, you get it from teachers. It's like it's like a sort of knowledge where like it's like it takes time to like it takes time to get that kind of knowledge. So can you make knowledge? I mean Maybe not necessarily make knowledge, but I mean, it takes time to like gauge knowledge. So like, I mean, you could make it, but over a long period of time. Okay. Unfortunately, I'm sure that it was pretty clear which students are from which class, but I do think we can take these moments of clarity and use them to reflect, change, and adjust our future classes. After holding these interviews, I now know that maybe I do need to take the time to teach some of these simpler things like giving a direct answer, keeping eye contact, having confidence, and the idea of knowledge, and how each of us can and will gain knowledge throughout our lives. Students need to know and they need to understand that no one can stop them from gaining knowledge no matter what. 
As I continued my research, I found a book called Why Poor Children Are More Likely to Become Poor Readers. And in this book, it says that surveys and research on children's reading and vocabulary development consistently found the literacy correlated with the professional, educational, and economic status of the children's parents, and that children from low-income families did generally less well than those from middle-class families. I know that as kids, they are unable to break free from these prisons that they're sometimes in, but they do need to understand that there is an entire world beyond high school in which they can break barriers and become someone who will one day say, my son or daughter is a product of their environment, and they're doing great in school and in their community, and they will succeed in life. So Carmen has had some similar experiences to me in the articles that I've mentioned, so I'm going to pass the camera to him and let him share his thoughts. Thanks, Sina. The fact that I work at a school made up of kids from districts all over Western New York made my investigation especially interesting as I was able to see how students from drastically different environments felt regarding knowledge. After reading uh, social class and school knowledge, I expected for the most part to find similar results, meaning that the students coming from districts, districts like Clarence and Williamsville would likely offer more thoughtful and in-depth answers, such as those offered by the students in, in the school that Anion labeled Affluent Professional School. And the students that came from inner city schools would tend to respond similarly to the students in the article from working class schools. Yet this wasn't always the case. For example, one of my students from Williamsville simply said that knowledge was being smart, and his first response to the question of where does knowledge come from was video games, while one of my students from the inner city provided really thoughtful and unique responses. She referred to knowledge as a trait you should cultivate and treasure that helps you succeed, not just academically, but also in life, claiming that it comes from hard work, dedication, passion, and motivation. She doesn't believe that you can simply find it in books. Instead, uh, she asserts that you have to connect with things and people and find it in yourself. I think it's really important to not judge students based on their social class and to have high expectations for all students. Ray C. Risk warns of the highly problematic issues that stem from such mistakes in his article, Student Social Class and Teacher Expectations, The Self-Fulfilling Prophecy in Ghetto Education. The evidence upon which Risk's arguments are based comes from a longitudinal study where he observes a class of kindergarten students periodically throughout the school year and then continues to study them in the first and second grade classes into which the majority of them go. His findings were shocking and quite alarming, with the seemingly most concerning revelation uh, centering on his assertion that kindergarten teacher uh, formed expectations regarding the potential ability of each of her students after only eight days of school, for this essentially meant that they were based on factors related to social background characteristics rather than academics. Furthermore, the teacher proceeded to group her students based on her initial expectations by means of scene arrangements. As if this wasn't problematic enough, she went on to give much more of her time, effort, and attention to the students that she assumed had more potential while neglecting the majority of the class, which she considered incapable. Risk contends that in the case of the kindergarten class he observed, the expectations were ultimately made based on four criteria. Physical appearance, such as the quality and quantity of clothing and cleanliness and such forth. Interactional behavior use of language, and a series of various social factors. In the end, the seating arrangements that began in kindergarten as a result of the teacher's definition of which child possessed or lacked the perceived characteristics for success emerged in the first grade as a caste phenomenon in which there was absolutely no upward mobility. The fact that risk compares our education system to a caste phenomenon with no upward mobility is horrifying, yet alludes to the fact that these problems will only continue to get worse with each ensuing year of being misjudged and neglected. Sylvia, you mentioned having experienced this yourself when you were in high school. Would you like to share what it was like? Yes, thank you, Carmen. Um, I am going to share my story on how the social background influenced my education. I actually did experience the wealth inequality in high school and middle school. I was judged by the teachers because the way I was dressed, the way I expressed myself using the words, or the way I was answering the question that I've been asked. In addition to that, my family family was from a lower, um, low income social status, so I did not get that extra help from the teachers or from my parents because their education stopped at the 8th grade so they didn't have the knowledge or the know their knowledge was limited. Uh, they, their, my parents' social situation forced them to go to work to support their parents so that was, that was the main reason they didn't finish their education. 
Meanwhile, the teachers at my school, they put all the focus on my richer friends because their parents was from the... Um, was better educated and have a, a better living that, that can provide them with um, education, better education support. I choose two articles for you guys. The first one is Social Class Difference in Family School Relationships by Annette Lorraine. And the second one is Social Class Difference in Parent Educational Expectation by Young. The second article uh, was um, the experience was wrote in China. But I think no matter which country we are, like you see I'm from Poland, the article is from China and we're focusing in the United States. I feel like the social um, background problem has... Um, it, many schools are facing the same problem. I think not only the teacher knowledge, but parents' social background have a huge impact on the child education, as well as the culture, religion, and of course social status. They all affect our students. In the school I work, um, every student comes from different social background. They all have different complexities. Um, and I think in this, in their scenario, the school and the teacher, teachers have the most impact on their education and their knowledge. So what I did with my students, because the word knowledge is too broad from them, so I present them with the questions about what they know, what they want to learn and how they can learn that. And this is their answers. For example, one student know, one student know about farming, um, taking care of the animals, uh, what he wants to learn is about cooking and how he can learn this is during lesson and what he learned so far uh, it's to follow direction my other student learn about know about sheep uh, he wants to learn about horses he can learn that during lesson and so far he learned how to take care of the chickens and eggs so how you can see um, all their answers are based on the knowledge they're getting from their school, um, the school environment, which they all working um, with the farm activities or garden activities where they can learn necessary skills that they can um, that can help them in the future. I also interview a um, few teachers. Um, how they address their knowledge in the classes, and this is their answer. Cool. So for our kids, we work on more functional, vocational tasks and more daily living skills, which for that we work on practicing brushing our teeth and teaching them how to set a table, how to prep their meals, how to help do cooking activities, things that will be functional for them as they get older. As far as vocational tasks, we do a lot of things in the seed room and making activities that involve the earth, which they can work on fine motor skills as well as math for weighing and sorting and one-to-one -one correspondence. But with us, we also want to work on more appropriate verbal language. So our students don't necessarily pick up on the social norms and etiquette of how they would talk to a peer or how they would talk to their family members and it's more demand oriented. So having them learn how to say things in appropriate sentence structure and how to request what they need and what they want in the appropriate manner rather than just stating a one, one word demand. Or if they use their device, making a sentence in their device of what they want to meet their needs and how they're going to go about their day. Uh, but for the most part, our knowledge is functional learning based where they get to take these skills and bring that into their real life as they eventually grow into adults and are going to be more on their own. So. Being that we're a residential school in upstate New York for children with special needs, serving some of the more challenging um, individuals in the special needs population, it's helpful for them to learn their academic skills in hand, through hands-on learning opportunities. So having multimodal opportunities through movement to learn their math skills and their English skills in the real context of activities is the most helpful and will provide them with the most success as they move into adult programming.
for maybe doing one of our cooking activities, which also allows us the opportunity to teach other skills at that same time. So I think to bring it all around would be the most important things for the population that we work with is providing our academic skills in a real contextual activity versus trying to do um, sit-down lessons that are worksheet-based. Carmen, I, you also interviewed some teachers, right? Thanks, Sylvia. Yeah, I was able to conduct a couple of interviews with the teachers that I work with, and I felt like they had some really interesting responses that relate to some of the things the teachers that you uh, interviewed mentioned. Um, that's a tough question. I feel like knowledge is just having having like information about something. Maybe it's not always academic, but it could be maybe someone's really knowledgeable about sports. Like just having knowledge in some area okay. and like feeling like you're you know a lot about something. Okay. Well, the most appropriate knowledge for them to have is just like a basic understanding of like you know multiplication um, facts and division facts and okay. you know Good. numbers. Um, that's an interesting question. Um, I think knowledge is is all around us. It, it's a um, compilation of the environment, uh, everything you do every day. Uh, it's in the books that we read. It's in the air that we, we breathe. It's in the water we drink. So, um, I, I think the knowledge that's really appropriate is we have a challenge of being both parent and teacher, okay? And I, I think to try at our age level to try to teach the kids right from wrong, um, what is fair and not fair, uh, how to view life uh, with an open mind, I think that is what our kids need the most since they really don't have uh, either a parent figure or um, someone who, can, they can, who really shows an awful lot of interest in them. The similarities and differences between the various responses given by the four teachers interviewed seem to reveal a need to not treat all students as if they're the same. Instead, we should teach them by addressing their individual needs, which essentially leads to differentiating knowledge based on a variety of factors, ranging from the students' strengths and weaknesses to their interests and the environments in which they live, as well as reflecting on what knowledge would be most beneficial to them in their lives outside of school. According to Anyan, her investigation revealed that there are class conflicts in educational knowledge and its distribution, as well as that we can see class conflict in the struggle to impose the knowledge of powerful groups on the working class and in student resistance to this class-based curriculum. Speaking of the distribution of knowledge, tracking is another aspect of our education system that tends to lead to students that come from working class families being placed on modified or vocational tracks and therefore being offered different types of knowledge and skills than the students of high class families in the AP high or honors track. While some may argue that tracking can be quite beneficial when placements are fair, Jeannie Oakes contends that it is never equitable to have any group of students be systematically offered less when it comes to educational equality. In her chapter, The Distribution of Knowledge, from her book, Keeping Track, she exposes the differences in educational opportunity for poor and minority students that stem from this process of tracking. Along the way, Oaks provides a number of powerful responses from students to the question regarding what the most important thing that they learned was in a particular class. While students in high track classes pointed to things like the way other countries govern themselves economically, socially, and politically, or political trends and cultural trends in relation to national and domestic events. Students from low track classes typically talk about things like how to cook and keep a house clean or how to get a job. Tracking therefore ultimately helps upper and middle class whites maintain their status by offering them a much more valuable set of skills and knowledge than the vast majority of poor minority students, thereby causing a further divide in academic achievement and attainment. Jean Anion concluded her article by stating that perhaps the most important implication of the present study is that for those of us who are working to transform society, there is much to do at all levels in, in education, and this remains true today. We have to hold all students to high expectations and find a way to provide equality in terms of educational opportunity for all students in order to bridge the ever-widened gap between the rich and poor. Thank you guys for watching our video. We hope you enjoyed our activity and hearing about the topics we feel so strongly about. Following you will see some questions that we want you to think about and reflect on.